Welcome to Indy Capital. I'm Pamela Nash, and this is Frank E. Jackson, Jr., here to talk about his two current films, Lorenzo and Monica, and Dead Money. Where are you at in production-wise with Dead Money? We have about two days of uh, shooting left for that project. Yep, so we are almost done. Yeah. And how's it going with Lorenzo and Monica? Um, it's done. We did a premiere for that locally. Um, uh, we, I'm kind of on hold with it right now because we're finishing up Dead Money, and we plan to, you know, get some major distribution for that, and then springboard off that, take that momentum to uh, make something happen with Lorenzo and Monica. Tell us yeah. a little bit about the story of Lorenzo and Monica. It's about um, a young couple. They they go on a crime spree, holding up stores with pellet guns. Uh, the whole concept is that. They hold up the stores, they turn themselves in, they do their time, and they figure that while they're in jail, Hollywood or someone from Hollywood will buy their story. So by the time they do their time and come out, they'll come out rich and famous. But it didn't quite work out that way. Yeah. And do we have a clip from Lorenzo and Monica? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, there's a scene where um, uh, Lorenzo, they're going to hold up one, a tire shop. And so the girl's very attractive. She's a cashier. And so uh, Lorenzo's kind of staring at her. And then uh, Monica gets the money. And then they leave. And then the next scene, they're in the uh, bedroom. And then she kind of goes off on him a little bit. So uh, lets her know how she feels about that. Yeah. Monica, what's your problem? The name of this corporation is Lorenzo and Monica. So if you're thinking of replacing me, you need to let me know right now. Monica, what the fuck are you talking about name? You know what I'm talking about. I saw you looking at her. Who? The cashier. Monica, seriously, you need to stop tripping. Sick of this shit, man. You know what I've been through. You know I don't like shit like that. Monica, why don't you just chill out and sit in? Fuck you, Lorenzo. Monica, come back and sit down. That girl was just a pretty face. That's all she was. This right here is home. Don't ever do that again. Describe this as a love story. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I, I read your, your promo stuff, and it's you know, kids on a crime spree. Mm -hmm. They're purposely trying to get famous. How how do you work in the the love story part of it? Well, it was marketed as a sort of like a crime story, but it's not. It's really primarily a love story. Both these teens came from diverse backgrounds. They went through some traumatic experiences, and they met the same night that they went through this. So they felt it was destiny that they meet. So they came up with this idea, but it really, you know, follows how their relationship develops. And in the meantime, they're holding up stores with pellet guns. So yeah, it's almost like a, uh, uh, a Romeo and Juliet. Yep. And Dead Money also has a little bit of a crime angle too. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about the story behind Dead Money. Yeah, I probably would categorize it as an urban 
gangster film, but uh, I didn't want to do the typical urban gangster film, and I found out about organ trafficking, which is something that's going on uh, pretty heavy in a lot of countries. So I said, what if local, a local urban gang or something got caught up in that? So it's about four kingpins who actually, you know, decide to get involved in organ trafficking so they can make some extra money, make a lot of money actually, so that they can get out of the drug gang. But what ends up happening is that people on the street or some of the local gangs start finding what they're doing and they literally start going out to kill people just to sell body parts and make money. But the original guys, they really, since they were drug dealers, they figured they would use the dead bodies from drug deals going bad. You know, not just kill somebody, but if they get killed in the process, make some money off of it. So once they find out that other people are doing it, they decide to get out the game. And I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah. And you know, you, you hear about these two films back to back and you think, wow, this guy's really into crime and violence. But if you look at the whole entire body of work mm -hmm. of Frankie Jackson Jr., you know that he's a tender guy with a sentimental side. Yeah, yeah. You've got, and I'm, I'm so interested in, in so many of these. I want to start with LaVonda King, I think. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about her story, and that really shows a very emotional mm -hmm. side. Yeah, um, she was one of the uh, nine victims uh, with that infamous Metro crash, you know, a few years back. And um, when it happened, you know, I came up with the idea for, called Nine Lives, and I plan to actually do a film about all of the people who were killed. So uh, I started doing my research and make a long story short, um, for, because of legal reasons, a lot of them wouldn't talk mm -hmm. to the media. So I, I pursued um, LaVonda, uh, Nikki King through Facebook, and I got in touch with her mother, Tawanda Brown. So we talked, and uh, she said, you know, everybody's telling me not to do this or not to talk to anyone in the media. She said, but for whatever reason, I feel that you can tell my daughter's story. So um, we sat down and we talked, and she pretty much transcribed her life to me. So really, the film is going to follow her life up to the crash, which is really an inspiration, you know, strong inspiration. Because at, the age of, at a very young age, she had already started her own business. You know, and she had been through a lot coming up sort of in the hood, you know. So she had made some changes in her life at a young age with, with, two, with two boys, you know, out of wedlock, you know, with different fathers. But she decided she wanted to start a business. And unfortunately, the crash happened, you know, right before the grand opening for her hair salon she was opening. Beauty, no, it was a hair salon, yep. You have, I, I've seen a clip from this film that was just beautiful and it's a, a mother-daughter conversation mm -hmm. where the mother is really trying to inspire her. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that scene and, and we'll show the clip? That scene, I think it shows the closeness between the mother and the daughter. Uh, the daughter got caught up in some things in school that she wasn't supposed to be caught up in. And her mother is, was going to pretty much teach a lesson, say, hey, if you want to act like a gangster, I'm going to put you in a school where gangsters are. So they were going to school in Prince George's County, and uh, and she decided to, you know, to because of some things happening, you know, she was kind of forced into a school in, in D.C., and that's what that conversation was about. And you saw uh, the girl that's playing LeVon Nikki King, she realized at that moment, you know, how her life was about to change, and you could see it in her, her expression. But it was also, I think, hard for the mother to put her into that situation, but she was just trying to teach her a lesson. And it's a, a beautiful moment in Tough Love that I think could stand, th this mother could have told that to any kid mm -hmm. and, it, and it would have an impact. I mean, it kind of had an impact on, and I'm way older than high school, but it, it kind of, you, you can hear the, the real truth of, of that motherly love coming through. How, how did you translate that for an actor? Because this is an actor, this isn't the actual mother making this speech. Yeah, well, Tia, Tia Day is the lady that's playing Tawanda Brown and they met, we all sit down, we sat down, we talked, and I wanted, Tia's a great actress, by the way, she's been in a number of things, and so I was very comfortable with her, her ability. And so she met with the mother, and, and they have similar backgrounds, and so she was able to connect with her, you know, and Tia has children of her own as well. So uh, that, the experience combined with having children of her own, I think, and just being a great actress, I don't think she had a problem at all connecting with the mother and, and translating that emotion. And we're gonna take a look at this very powerful clip. But that's not fair, Mom. I didn't flash the gun. I understand, Nikki. But because you and Tanisha both like the same guy, we run the risk of this happening again. 
So what am I supposed to do? Just stop talking to him? Maybe. But Ma, that's not fair. Look, Nikki, when I was in school, people didn't pull guns. We just got into fights, and in three days, it was over. Now, kids are dying over stupid shit. So the schools have to change their rules in order to build the times. Ma, I really don't care. She confronted me. Unfortunately, you're being forced to learn a very tough lesson at a very young age. It's called being responsible. You know, maybe hanging out with Rashad wasn't such a great idea. But my, he pursued me. I didn't pursue him. And he has the right to talk to whoever he wants. Maybe Tanisha should just grow up. I know, Nikki, and I agree. But it's just the world that we live in. So what happens next? Well, I've enrolled you into a school, Woodmont High in D.C. What? Look, oh, no other high schools in PG County would accept you. But D.C., ma, that's even worse. Well, let's just look at it as a test of your character. If you can deal with the students there and still excel in school, then you can deal with people anywhere. If you do well, I promise you, I'll do all within my power to get you back into Lago so that you can graduate with your friends. But you've got to give me something to work with, okay? Your work is just so fascinating to me because on one hand, there's this guy that really gets the heart and the emotion of, of humans. And then you've got this interesting twist on not your typical take on crimes. And I want to talk about Torn for a second. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so captivated by that story. Where do you come up with the ideas to, to pull these twists? Well, um, Torn, a lot of people say, did you go through that? No, and, and <laughs> I, I didn't go through that, but I know a lot of people. Uh, I've been married. Um, and, and, and so I think having talked to a lot of people that have been married or, or that are married and what I've, my experience is I was able to develop my own philosophies, I think, on some things. And so I, I kind of implemented that a little bit into, into Torn. But the actual storyline of Torn I never experienced, fortunately, and I hope I never do. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do you develop these ideas? I mean, this is... You, I haven't seen any work from you that I would be like, oh, that's typical. That's right. like these are our fresh, interesting takes. Where, where, where's your well? Where's your fountain? Oh, <laughs> uh, I put I put myself in the position of a viewer. You know, I, I see I watch films all the time, and um, being a filmmaker, sometimes it's hard for me to watch a film and not critique it because I'm a director. But but being a director, if I'm able to watch a movie and and it captivates me. And I, then that, and I study that film, and I'm like, you know, you know, what did they do? What are the elements of that? To, and so I put myself in a position of a viewer and say, you know, I don't want to bore them, you know. So I mean, I, I figure if you do, number one, I think if you do heartfelt stories, that's always going to reach people because a lot of people go through that. But at the same time, you're doing heartfelt stories. I don't think people want to see their lives unfold on the screen. I think they want to. They want to uh, connect with it, but they also want to see some interesting things to kind of take them away from what, what it is that they're going through. So I try to implement original ideas and, and takes and stuff. You got to put that little, I guess, the movie flavor on it, you know, and kind of the, the um, take people, work people's imagination as opposed to just straight reality, you know, when they're watching films. So I try to mix uh, uh, my imagination or imaginative uh, elements in with the reality part to keep people interested. So how, how do you make that balance? On, on one hand, you have interesting, important things to say about people, about relationships, about society. On the other hand, you're very well aware that you need people to see your movie for your point to be made. How, how do you balance that? Um, yeah, I watch a, num watch a lot of movies and I see great films and, and I realize you um, it's, I can't say it's, it's written in, in stone how to do it. You know, it's kind of intuitive, you know, if I'm writing or if I'm directing how to do it or what twist to add in there to, to keep people interested. Uh, it's, I can't just answer that in one sentence, like how do I, you know, find that balance, you know.
kind of tough. Oh, you don't have to do a sentence. <laughs> Talk <laughs> yeah. to me. Um, you know, if, if, if I connect with it, mm -hmm. if it can move me, then I figure it's going to move the audience, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, I, I'll take um, Torn, for example. The way Torn ends may not be the typical way Torn ends. You know, I kind of put like, what? How does the audience want it to end? Mm -hmm. So I threw that in, ending in there. You know, so to me that was the balance. It's like people are watching it; they're connecting with what's going on, and that's the reality part of it. But how many people are in unhappy marriages that wish they could meet someone that would take them out of that situation? Or how many people? You, well, you, you you catch my drill. So it's yeah. like I I put that element in there. So that people could kind of like give them hope if they're in a bad relationship, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think for Torn, that's how I did that. And I think I kind of take that concept in every film, you know. I love you. I love you so much. I love you too. You're in my world, do you realize that? Do you realize that? Everything's changed now. I think there's just some things in life you cannot explain. That could very well have spiraled into like a comedy or a farce, mm -hmm. but it didn't. So how, how do you know how far to go before you tip into ridiculous? Um, once again, it's kind of, I don't know, it's like I have this internal system I go by. If I look at it and it's unbelievable, then I'm like, I don't think the audience is going to buy it. You know, and, and, and at that point, you know, like what, but a lot of that, I capture that in, in the writing before it goes to mm -hmm. film. Because, I mean, the, the script obviously has to be, you know, on point. That, that, that's the core. So uh, if, if, I, if, if, the script, if I'm not buying the script, if I'm not buying the story, I don't think the audience is going to buy the story. So I really capture it there if it's like, oh, no, that's too much. That's not real. Oh, no, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should change this or change that. And then, obviously, you know, you have a, you, I, you know, for me, I have a group of people that I trust who mm -hmm. I can give a script to or idea to and, and get an honest opinion from them and people who are not necessarily connected or connected to me or feel any reason to be uh, showing any allegiance to me mm -hmm. and giving me their honest opinion about something. And I think that's good in filmmaking. You gotta have people that, that, that are opposite or think different the way you think to give honest opinions because that's your viewing audience. The idea of it was like, oh God, now I know everything about this guy that I need to know. And then I saw the clip of it and I'm right. like, this is extremely tense. Right. This is extremely well done. This is yeah. nothing compared to what I, I guess my imagination was too limited right. For, right. Right. for the film that you made. Right. So tell me a little bit about that because that was captivating. Well, I, honestly, when people say give me a log line or a, a synopsis, I don't, I don't like, it, mm -hmm. I, I don't like, because sometimes, you know, in, in two sentences, it's hard to describe the, the uniqueness of a movie. Like, right. I, like Seven Pounds, for example. You've seen Seven Pounds. Mm -hmm. Very unique film, but if you, I read the synopsis for it, and it sounded kind of bland, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think they probably had to do that according to industry standards. So I'm not really crazy about trying to describe it. In it. But that being said, uh, with Sweat, um, you know, if you read the synopsis, yeah, it sounds kind of 
you know, kind of bland and kind of simple. But when you actually start watching the movie and getting into the elements of the, the movie, the elements of the characters and the diversity there, and, and then it, and, and also the mood of the film, the mm -hmm. style that is being shot, all those things add to that overall concept of the film where if you just, you know, just uh, like, okay, well, I read the synopsis, it's whatever, I'm not going to watch it. You just, you don't really get a chance to see uh, what, you, what the actual film's about and how to translate that in, in the synopsis, apparently that hasn't been figured out yet, I don't think by too many people, you know, so. So let's talk about that because you have work that is emotional, that is deep, that does affect the viewer. And you have kind of a limited amount of time to, to, to let them know that, to, to get them to look at your film. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the best way to get that message out? Um, you mean from a, from a film point of view or just in general? In more, uh, let, let's talk about like the, the marketing and the, the putting that film out there because I'll, I'll tell everybody right now, DC, watch his films, you will be moved, you will be interested. You can just take it from me, watch his films. But for those of you not watching the program, you've got a log line, you've got a synopsis, you've got an, an, a piece of artwork. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you really get people to know that? I think like this form right here is one way which I applaud you know, what, what you're all doing here in this entire concept because people can hear what I have to say and how, you know, from my heart and how I feel about things. And that alone may make them say, you know, I want to see his films. Where if they have never heard what I have to say then, then they may not be interested in yeah. that film. So uh, I think that um, obviously, you know, if you have a film, you have a concept, you know, the website, you know, Facebook, all the social media, all those type uh, 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 tools that you can use to put the concept up there, to put that mood up there, to put that trailer, put that feel out there. I think, you know, all of those ways definitely needs to, need to be exploited, you know. Um, but I think that it's branding yourself, you know, like I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to brand myself as I'm trying to brand the concept, mm -hmm. you know, and I think if you can get people to buy into the concept of what you do, then you can develop a following, you know, a, a, like that, as opposed to just kind of like branding one individual, so. Well, I am definitely buying into that concept. I mean, I've looked at your work in connection with this show and was very impressed by, by the emotional heart of it all. But yet you have the action, you have the excitement, you have the crime, you have the fresh twist on things that we haven't seen before. So definitely have a fan here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Tell me about um, Sanjata Productions. Um, when I was looking for a name, where pretty much with all the films, I try to find something unique. Uh, I was looking for a unique name. And uh, Sanjata, he was an African king that built a city from a jungle. When I read that, that meaning, I was like, OK, he took nothing and created something, which is how Sanjata started. You know, it's not like I had financing funding in my first few films. You know, I, I had the camera, I had the lights, I had the boom, and I was a one-man show, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started with nothing, and then, you know, over the course of time, you know, you know, I, you know I've been blessed, been grown, and have grown in a lot of areas. So the concept of, Sanj of Sanjata, the king himself, actually, in, to me, those same concepts is what I use. You know, like hard work, you know, dedication, commitment, you know, integrity, you know, and uh, and also even with San Sanjata, he built a uh, city from a jungle. So I see trees, I see, uh, when you see trees, branches, and, and it goes out, well, branches provide shade for people to protect them from the sun. So I, I, I'm looking at stability, you know, so I was trying to build something that's gonna be around for a while, and not just come and go, but, you know, I think the industry itself is, um, you know, I think a lot of, people are exploited in the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, women, for example, who, who are in their youth are beautiful, but as they get older, you know, they feel the need to get, make changes to their body so they can continue to look youthful so they can be accepted in the industry, which is, that's kind of driven by the industry, which is something I personally don't like. So it's like uh, those concepts, I'm trying to, you know, instill different concepts in people in, in film industry. Okay, if you get older, age gracefully and find parts to fit you, you know, for your age, so, as opposed to feeling like you have to continue looking young to get those parts, you know. So. And are you going to be writing parts for, for women that are over 25? Um, definitely. I mean, it's, I, I can't say what drives me to write is mm -hmm. that, you know, if I have, I have diversity in stories that will always bring in people of all ages, nationalities, you name it, you know. 
sizes, everything. So, Well, I, I really like the analogy that you said about the tree with the branches because you also have roots mm -hmm. on a tree. And you're somebody that actually could bail out of the DC market and go on to bigger and better things, but you don't. You stay here mm -hmm. and you continue to get people work in the DC area. Um, talk a little bit about what, what keeps you here? What keeps you home? Well, initially I think I had the same dream as, as a lot of uh, aspiring filmmakers, you know. I would do the big film, get picked up, get a deal, three picture deal, you know, something like that. And I, and I was thinking like that for a long time and I was going at it pretty strong, you know. And, and with, I've gotten festivals, about two or three straight to DVD. You know, I was built a, a resume on Wikipedia, IMDb, stuff like that. And but it's very frustrating. It's, 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 it, pursuing success in industry is very frustrating. It can wear you down emotionally, physically, mentally, which is why I think a lot of people in the industry end up turning to things like drugs and all these other extremities. But, um, and I think I got to that point. I hit a breaking point, you know, because of that. it's a constant pressure that you feel, you know. So, and I got to that breaking point, and after that breaking point, I was like, you know, I don't know, it's kind of like I had a moment of vision, or whatever you want to call it, and it's like, you know, my whole life I've rebelled against systems, starting with school, uh, with, with corporate America, the military, you know, I, I just rebelled. So, and then, and then I found myself re rebelling against the system with Hollywood. So I'm like, if I've been rebelling against the system all my life, why am I trying to fit into another system? And so that's when I realized that, you know, I feel my call never was to quote unquote break into Hollywood, but to uh, create our own hub here in the DC area, be a person that's a, a forerunner to help create opportunities for other people. And it's like when I realized that, I can't explain it, it's like financing came easier, you know, it's just, uh, uh, Torn was kind of like the baby of mm -hmm. that concept. And when I realized that, you know, we got Torn was financed, Lorenzo and Monica was financed, this film that we're working on now was financed, and uh, Star Power, you know, it's coming easier, uh, so it's like uh, each film will get more and more star power. So it's like things are starting to come easier, and so now my vision is definitely to be create opportunities for people locally. I think the talent's here, I think the technical expertise is here, I think the funding is here in this area. So I'm pretty committed to the DC metropolitan area. Well, we hope those roots keep extending because yeah. I think a lot of people have the urge to, like you said initially, I'm going to do a few things in DC and then I'm going to break into Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're committed to the DC theater scene then, or the DC film scene rather, like we can grow our own community and, mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to do and yep. we are really, really blessed to have you be a right. part of it. Yep. And um, I want to thank you very much for your work has been, uh, this has been a great experience for thank me, you, for um, learning about your work and we'll be checking in with you hopefully in the future. I appreciate it. I think this is a great forum and thank you for having me. Thank you. Yep. For Indie Capital, I'm Pamela Nash, and this was Frank E. Jackson, Jr.